Good evening. Um, back at Towson, uh, this is our first session of our course, The President, the Press, and Democratic Society. In uh, the two last years, we've done a course on the White House and the, their communications operations and looking at the relationship from the perspective of reporters and officials. This year, we're looking a little more broadly at the whole issue of what kind of information the public needs in a democratic society, what kind of information they're actually getting, and if there is a gap between them, what causes that gap. And uh, assuming that there are several reasons on both sides, of uh, both the government and of news organizations, um, we want to explore uh, why that is so. And so our first guest is particularly appropriate to have as Ed at the beginning here because he knows uh, a great deal about the operations of news organizations. He worked for the New York Times. He was a White House correspondent and he knows the, uh, the presidency. He worked in television uh, with CBS in the Sunday morning program and he worked at the News Hour as a media critic and has a good perspective of how news organizations operate. And I, I thought we, we can begin. I would like to get to the uh, statement that you put together for the uh, Continue Conference of the American Society of Newspaper Editors where we were looking at anonymous sources. But I thought before we do that, um, give me uh, a view from uh, your perspective of what kind of information the public needs in a democratic society. Well, I, I mean, obviously, uh, Martha, they need, a, they need the enough information to come to a judgment as to what their government is doing, um, why they are doing it, and sufficient detail and background and context to reach a judgment whether they, the public, they, the individual voter or the public collectively, mm -hmm. approves, disapproves of what the government is doing. Um, that's a judgment they make um, on a daily basis. But then, of course, every four years for the president, anyway, and every two years for parts of Congress, mm -hmm. they make a judgment uh, as to whether or not this is the course of action they want uh, uh -huh. they want to be on, and then they they exercise that in in the polling booth. It seems to me, I mean, that's that's sort of you know the most fundamental right. thing that they right. have to have. Uh -huh. And so the question you related question you ask is. Are they getting it? Mm -hmm. And uh, the polls show that the public is not convinced that they are getting it, that they are getting enough to make an mm -hmm. informed decision on <clears throat> the policies that are being pursued. One of the most interesting barometers is the uh, polling question that is asked all the time, which is, is the country going in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very um, good question. It's been asked for many right. years by yeah. pollsters because it, it isn't so much a judgment on do you like this president, George W. Bush, his performance or not. It, it's a larger question about the direction of the government and the country, mm -hmm. the economy, uh, foreign affairs. It embraces kind of everything. Uh -huh. And I, I believe... Uh, that for politicians uh, who want to get reelected, it is a devastatingly important poll right. consideration because if enough people think the country is not going in the right direction, and that could mean uh, economically, uh, maybe first and foremost, then the incumbent's in trouble. Mm -hmm. and, and that trouble is going to manifest itself sooner or later. But a lot of things go into it, how you feel about security, particularly after 9-11. Mm -hmm. Do you feel secure? Do you feel that you're being protected? That's one of the fundamental, fundamental requirements of, of uh, 
of the government mm -hmm. is to keep you safe and, and allow you to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. And so, so it seems to me uh, it's, it's a measure of that. Anyway, you go on. I'll, I mean, I have other thoughts. How, how you do want. you know, how would citizens know what they don't know? Um, well, or is, is that something that it's always going to come out? That, uh, you know, maybe people think, well, yes, they are getting all the information they need from uh, news organizations, you know, that it's, that it's all out there in the public domain or all they need. Um, and then they find out, uh, uh, you know, there are programs like, say, the NSA um, eavesdropping, uh, which is something people yeah. did not know about. So there's a perfect example of something that they didn't know they didn't know. Yeah. There, th this was a secret program, and it, it was not known until it was disclosed in the New York Times. <clears throat> and uh, only, only then have some aspects of it become mm -hmm. public. But if any of you watched the Attorney General in his uh, elusive performance in front mm -hmm. of uh, the Senate um, Judiciary Committee the other day, uh, he, <clears throat> he was not answering many questions. He was not filling in many details. Uh -huh. So here the public knows that A, they didn't know about it until it was disclosed. Mm -hmm. B, they can tell they they still don't have the full story, right? And uh, therefore, it becomes hard for them, I think, to make a bottom line judgment mm -hmm. as to whether this uh, infringement of individual liberties is justified by the um, the risk, mm -hmm. the nature of the risk. Mm -hmm. And so, this is an absolutely classic example of what they d didn't know they didn't know, mm -hmm. and. Um, they find out only when the press is able to perform its function and disclose it uh, in a responsible and credible and accurate mm -hmm. way. And um, we know now that the New York Times had this story for a year mm -hmm. prior to its publication and kept it uh, from publication both at the request of the government mm -hmm. and they said because they needed more time for more reporting, flesh out the story. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, it, I'll take both at face value. <clears throat> we know that in this case, the President of the United States met with the publisher of the paper, Arthur Salzberger, mm -hmm. and the editor, Bill Keller, personally. Now, this is pretty unusual mm -hmm. in an effort to keep that story out of the paper. And I don't know if any of you saw it, but last night on the broadcast that I've worked for uh, uh, for the last eight years, uh, the News Hour with Jim Laird. Jim did a lengthy interview with uh, Vice President Cheney. Cheney. Cheney was unapologetic. Mm -hmm. He said this program was secret, should have been secret, should still be secret. Its details should remain secret. He was dismissive of the criticism, criticisms mm -hmm. that suggested that um, uh, this was a serious infringement of, of individual rights and possible violation of the law. And he stood there saying, in effect, we know better. Mm -hmm. We know what we know. Mm -hmm. And you, the public, you don't have to know. Because you've elected us, mm -hmm. this is this is implicit in what he said, right. not yeah. uh, not explicit. Um, you've elected us. We have taken the minimum step, which was to inform the eight key members of Congress, the leaders and the uh, chairman and ranking members of the of the two operative committees, mm -hmm. Judiciary and Intelligence, <clears throat> and therefore we've met the requirements and the mm -hmm. requirements of the law. Well, as you know, not everybody agrees with that. Right, and they're having to. The political realities are such that they are getting uh, so much criticism from members of their own party that today they have uh, they've given some additional information. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when Gru very grudgingly. Right. Um, and so we've got a fundamental argument here. We've got people who say it's against the law what they're mm -hmm. doing. That's one body of opinion. You've got people saying it's a um, 
uh, excessive use of executive powers, mm -hmm. uh, that the only clearances they got for this program were from the executive branch agencies, the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, the Office of Legal Counsel. Those are all executive branch um, offices or agencies, and you know yeah. they, they cannot plausibly and reasonably investigate themselves, right. or not credibly. Yeah. And then additionally, they, um, they indicated in one of the briefings, um, Press Secretary Scott McClellan indicated that there is a continual um, uh, review of what's going on, and that review is, is performed by the shift supervisor. And so I don't know that that's going to be a threshold that, um, you know, that, that members of Congress are going to... Uh, uh, is that going to give you much that. comfort? <laughs> um, Cheney said last night in the interview <clears throat> that um, it, this authority, presidential authority, has, had, has been renewed 30 times because it lasts for 45 days at a time. Mm -hmm. That's it's just the way it works. Right. I don't know, executive order or what it is. That's what it lasts, 45. So it's been re reviewed, he says, 30 times, but it's by the same people mm -hmm. for 30 times. So all yeah. of whom believe it's an important and essential tool in the war against al-Qaeda. And so you have, a, you have a classic debate for your, your issue, your point, mm -hmm. your principle here. What do people need to know? Is it important mm -hmm. for them to know about such a program? Mm -hmm. I would argue yes. Mm -hmm. um, Richard Cheney says no. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, secondly, when do they know enough mm -hmm. to make a judgment as to whether it's something they want their government to do or don't? Well, that's a hard, that's a more difficult question yeah. to answer. You know, that's a that's a rather nuanced thing. But at some point, they finally get enough knowledge about what's really going on. But right now, they don't have that. For example, how many people have uh, have had their phones tapped and their email um, inspected right. and possibly yeah. their uh, physical mail uh -huh. uh, opened? We don't know. Yeah. Won't answer. Uh, and conceivably, what are known as black bag jobs, mm -hmm. where people, where the FBI, and certainly has in the past, goes into people's uh, records, safes, files, and Mm -hmm. and actually takes information. So you couldn't have a better example of what you're talking yeah. about. And you wonder, too, uh, where reporters have come into this. Uh, so, for example, if they say that um, an al-Qaeda connection has to be on one side or somebody from an organization that is somehow um, affiliated with al-Qaeda, well, when reporters are working <clears throat> these stories about terrorism and national security, they're going to be dealing with a lot of people who might be in one of these organizations. So would tapping reporters' um, phones be, um, um, be a fruitful source for information? Well, I would say that it is a certain uh -huh. source of, or target, rather, yes. of tapping. Right. Yeah. Uh, you can count on it. Right. So are there protections um, that that I, uh, I sometimes go on the Al Jazeera website. Mm. <laughs> I communicate uh, with the, um, some of the people at Al Jazeera, journalists uh -huh. and managing directors and right. others, because I know them, uh, because I have recently joined a sort of international board of visitors of Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that every time I type in uh, an address to aljazeera.net, uh -huh. That, uh -huh. you know, it's picked up. It's, it's, I have to assume yes. Mm -hmm. um, I have nothing to be ashamed of in what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm, uh, emailing back and forth. Generally, it is email. Sometimes phone calls, mm -hmm. uh, but it's usually email. And uh, so I'm not concerned about it, but I also don't believe that it's private. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you think that we are going to have uh, sufficient information is going to come out? Well, and, and where will it come out from? Well, that's a, I mean, those are, that's a very good question, very hard to answer, because <clears throat> first level of information will come out from congressional hearings mm -hmm. that are already being held. They have not been very fruitful so far, mm -hmm. but they're not over. There will be more. 
and we'll see if more information about the program is disclosed. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the further reporting by journalists mm -hmm. uh, may uh, uh, pull out more. It already has. We now know that there have been thousands, not mm -hmm. a handful or hundreds, but thousands of these. And we also know that most of them have not produced any uh, useful information. Right. And they are, quote, leads that have not been pursued. Mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in looking at uh, presidents and, and trying to, uh, to stop uh, particular stories, Kennedy had a different response um, in the Bay of Pigs when the New York Times was going to, um, had the story and was going to, uh, to use it. And, um, and Kennedy prevailed upon them not to print it. And Correct. then afterwards he said that if they had printed it, he might have been saved from making a mistake. <laughs> well, terrible <laughs> blunder in his early days, his days. as uh, yeah. president. Uh, and he said that publicly. He had the, the class to say that, that uh, uh -huh. in hindsight not only had the, had the invasion been a mm -hmm. mistake, but that if he had, if, uh, it had been disclosed. Uh, he might not uh, have gone through because there would have been a great hue and cry and of course the element of surprise would have been lost and so uh, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, he wouldn't have gone through with it. That story was written by a friend of mine, the late Tad Schultz, oh, yeah. who had uh, more uh, details than were printed and uh, President Kennedy approached the then publisher of the New York Times, Orville Dreyfus, and asked him uh, uh, to hold the story, mm -hmm. not to print it. What they ended up doing was something of a compromise in which a story was printed, but many of the details uh -huh. were deleted. Uh -huh. in, uh, in, in this case, and I guess in that too, there, there is a, an interesting uh, relationship that you can see um, between government and the press where it is both um, antagonistic but also cooperative and antagonistic in this case because the, uh, the administration did not want the information published, but cooperative in the sense that the information that the New York Times and then that the Washington Post has been digging up as well is serving as the base for the congressional hearings. That's what they're starting off with. Precisely. And you know, you could see that when you go back <clears throat> to Watergate, that in Watergate, the Washington Post developed a great deal of information with um, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein and then Seymour Hersh in the New York Times as well. But all of them could only take it to a certain point because the government has the power of subpoena. Exactly. And then, then it was uh, taken over by, uh, really by the courts and, uh, and the Congress. And so you can see at the same time you have both kinds of strains. In and you don't have to go back that far. <clears throat> to Watergate, you can go back a couple, three months to when Dana Priest had a series of stories in the Washington Post in which she disclosed the existence of the um, these so-called black detention centers uh -huh. in, um, in countries in Eastern Europe and elsewhere around the world where the CIA holds and interrogates um, suspected mm -hmm. Uh, enemy combatants or uh, alleged terrorists. Now that was not known, mm -hmm. that, the, that the CIA was operating a whole uh, network mm -hmm. of such um, uh, facilities mm -hmm. and moving people from place to place uh, by private jet yeah. in a process known as rendition, mm -hmm. that was not known. So that's another case of where the public didn't know what it didn't know. Mm -hmm. But once it read about it, it had partial knowledge, and then the hearings uh, have and are still to be held yeah. on that. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is the function of the press, and you have two particularly vivid examples within the last few months. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's any difference between um, the political parties uh, when they come into power in terms of the kinds of information they provide? The differences in Democrats and Republicans or the differences um, between administrations vary with uh, environmental conditions? Yeah. 
I mean, I think it, it's, it's largely governed more, certainly governed more by the surrounding circumstances mm -hmm. uh, that might govern it. In other words, you've had uh, periods of war or, or declared and undeclared mm -hmm. when uh, there were secret programs and steps taken by the government and under the and justified on the grounds that the nation mm -hmm. was at war. Um, and that that goes for Democrats as well as Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, now certainly in Vietnam, you had both LBJ and Nixon. You had you had both Democrat and Republican mm -hmm. presidents. Um, and uh, Clinton uh, certainly carried out secret programs and secret interrogations. Mm -hmm. That, uh, but generally speaking. I mean, I, I would honestly uh, defer to you as a student of, of mm -hmm. uh, White House communications and the flow of information. Um, there's a, to answer the larger question, is it more prevalent among Democratic administrations than Republican administrations? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would say that, let's look at Congress, you will have many more expressions of concern about civil liberties and uh, freedom and openness from Democratic members, but that's because we have a Republican administration. Right, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, to attach a party label to it, I think, is yeah. all. Yeah, I think it, it's much more the uh, conditions at the, uh, at the time and what kind of threats there are, and whether it's national security information. But um, what, is the, uh, what is the impact on the relationship with the public, if the public feels that somehow it's not getting the, um, the information it needs? Is there some cor uh, corrosive um, effect that it has on the re its relationship, its view with government? Or does that go back with its general feeling whether government's going in the right direction? I think it also it has a corrosive effect on uh, the public's view of government, but in all honesty, uh, I have to say it has a corrosive effect of the public's view of the news organizations and the media and whether they're doing their job. Mm -hmm. uh, poll after poll shows that the public expects and respects the watchdog role of the media, mm -hmm. that uh, expects news organizations to dig and to disclose that information, which can and should be disclosed, that does not jeopardize life and 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 uh, you know the lives of troops in the field or something like that. They certainly would draw the line there. Uh huh. But um, it is um, uh, it has a corrosive effect. And and if you don't believe your government, if you don't believe your government is leveling with. I think that has inevitably a corrosive effect on your view of that government or that administration. <clears throat> and um, it takes a lot to justify it in the minds of many in the public. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the change in the speed of the news cycle makes a difference? That it becomes, we have expectations now that an administration answers something immediately. We expect an answer. And that if they wait for some time that we figure that, you know, that means something bad. You know, they're trying to get a story that together. That they have something to, to hide. hide. Yeah. When, in fact, it can be a matter of uh, gathering the facts. But in, you know, in days of yore, like say in the Eisenhower administration, when the U-2 was shot down over the uh, Soviet Union, they had some time to prepare, even though they had trouble with it and they had trouble with their story. Well, it was not immediately and publicly known. <laughs> right. And, uh, and they just said it was a weather plane because they thought the pilot would not have survived. As it turned out, the pilot was captured. And so then they had to fess up. But they had a, they had a much longer lead time to, uh, to deal with it. Whereas today, we expect answers uh, quickly. And uh, that leads to a couple of things: uh, getting um, immature information uh, when when information is provided that maybe they have to come back on, um, and uh, and then creating a sense that they're not being forthcoming. 
Well, I think it puts pressure both on government to respond quickly <clears throat> and on news organizations to report quickly. And accuracy is the first victim mm -hmm. uh, on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that is the cycle in which we live now. But I would argue that uh, certain things are quite resistant to that. I mean, the, the uh, Bush administration, as I was saying earlier, is not uh, forthcoming yet about the NSA uh, mm -hmm. domestic um, surveillance project. Uh, not in the detail that, that uh, many people would like to see them produce. So they're not... Uh, they're not leveling fully with the public yet, and their argument is that they shouldn't, mm -hmm. and that there are good and valid reasons and, not and legal to. reasons, yeah. But do you well, they say legal reasons, right. uh, but people challenge that. Sorry, yes. Right. Um, do you think that the standards are different uh, as far as when they need to respond in, in domestic matters rather than foreign policy or national security? that national security people will say, well, you know, that's a, an issue that, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they have to think about a little longer before they release information. Whereas if it's something that's dealing with um, a scandal, let's, well, let's just pick Jack Abramoff. And what kind of contacts did Jack Abramoff have with White House officials? How many times did he come in? What meetings did he have with the president? and that sort of information. I think there is a much greater presumption of pressure. It's not a presumption. There's much greater pressure mm -hmm. on uh, an administration, an agency, a White House to disclose what it knows about a domestic matter yeah. than a foreign or especially national security matter. And the pressure is uh, very, very strong and the price for not doing so is politically very high. Mm -hmm. One example I think of uh, how um, uh, tight the administration is with information in terms of uh, what comes out of the White House is the fact that the wave lists, the wave lists are, are the ones uh, where uh, they have the names of everybody who comes into the White House, when they came in, when they left, and those are uh, those are, you know, on computer, there are computer files of those. And in a previous administration, wave lists came out all the time in the Clinton administration when, uh, uh, when uh, reporters were searching for information, they would find out what, uh, how many times somebody had come in. In this administration, you have not seen any information coming out from those wave lists. And I thought that's an example of the way this White House has been much mm -hmm. tighter than uh, earlier administrations. Well, of course, they have the very recent um, illustration of the complications uh, it can uh, uh, make uh, because, of course, it was those lists of admissions uh, to the White House that um, uh, documented how many times Monica Lewinsky went right. in to see right. Bill Clinton during yeah. that whole affair. So. Right. <clears throat> so this White House had a pretty vivid example of uh, how dangerous those uh, <laughs> that kind of information should be. On the other hand, uh, it's supposed to be the public's business mm -hmm. being conducted in there, mm -hmm. and therefore you could argue that the public um, should have a right to know who comes in and who goes out and who sees whom and, uh, and access to that information mm -hmm. and perhaps phone logs and other things, uh -huh. um, unless... There is a reason not to, uh, mm -hmm. national security or, or privacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the Clinton administration, um, of course, he was dealing with Republicans up on the Hill um, and with the subpoena power. And so all of those lists were having to come out uh, that way, whereas in this administration, they don't have to fear that. With, uh, with some of those, but it's... Uh, not with the congressional, but, uh, but they have a special prosecutor, as you well know, right. investigating the leak yeah. involving the disclosure of the mm -hmm. identity of Valerie Plame. That special prosecutor has subpoena power. Mm -hmm. That special prosecutor immediately demanded and immediately received all the phone logs mm -hmm. from the White House officials that he thought might have been remotely involved, mm -hmm. including many people who sat in this chair, from mm -hmm. Carl Rove to... Yeah. I don't know who else you've had, Scooter Libby and... Dan Bartlett. <coughs> right. 
<laughs> and Dan Bartlett and people like that. Yeah, the Scott special McClellan. prosecutor, uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, uh, demanded those records from the White House, and he received them. Uh, and the reason he received them is that they knew perfectly well that he could have issued a subpoena for them, mm -hmm. in which they'd have to go to court to fight. Right. So they turned them over. What do you think that particular case tells us about the state of the relationship between government and the press? Well, it shows just how adversarial it has become. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that here's a case where government officials disclose the identity of a, uh, at the time, undercover CIA agent in order, apparently, to embarrass and intimidate a critic her husband, Ambassador Joseph mm -hmm. Wilson, and um, and then has sought not to be um, identified as the source of, of uh, that information. And you have um, a call for a leak, uh, I mean for an investigation of a leak, which leads to a special prosecutor, <clears throat> which then turns around and subpoenas members of the press and makes that, yeah. uh, makes that, uh, very difficult. Um, so it illustrates <clears throat> the adversarial nature of the relationship these days mm -hmm. between um, this administration and news organizations. Not, it's not the only administration that's had problems, but this one does. Um, you used the word before, antagonistic mm -hmm. relationship, and I almost objected to the use of that word. Because to me an antagonism is when you're, you're, uh, you're angry. Uh, if I'm antagonistic to you, I'm, I'm not only disagree with what you're saying, but I'm, I'm angry at you. It's a personal thing mm -hmm. and I'm antagonistic. Uh, adversarial, which is the classic description, is that you have a difference of opinion. I, I take one side of the story, you take the other. That's adversarial. Mm -hmm. I may not be antagonistic, but I can be adversarial. In this case, and in this mood, and in this White House, I'd say you were using the right, right word. word. Yeah. But interestingly, there was also a very cooperative aspect of the relationship. When you looked at the kinds of relationships that reporters had with, uh, with officials, that... Um, Where? When? Uh, well, for example... Bob Woodward knew about uh, knew about yes. the Valerie plane, we and now know. And, um, and didn't think much of it uh, of the information that uh, or he chose was getting. to keep it private for a book. Yeah, <laughs> which brings up another another set of questions, <laughs> and uh, the relationships uh, with um, uh, of of Libby and uh, Judith Miller as as mm -hmm. well that here you had the uh, word uh, cozy yes, arises. right it does and it and and it gave a, it gave you a feeling that here reporters were willing to um, uh, to do some covering for people um, and and uh, and not tell exactly what these officials were up to and what Libby was up to when you put together all the different stories of the uh, relationships with reporters, then you get the picture, as, as you say, that they had a campaign where they were trying to discredit um, Wilson's uh, op-ed piece. And, and, and whoever leaked that, or, or, the, or the officials, plural, who uh, leaked that information to reporters, counted on the uh, Pledge of Confidentiality, mm -hmm. uh, counted on the fact that reporters would not uh, blow the whistle on them and not disclose their identity as anonymous sources. Mm -hmm. because, and they counted on that as to make it effective mm -hmm. as yeah. a weapon. They counted ev evidently on the fact that um, the reporters or some reporters would be willing to possibly even go to jail to protect that confidentiality. Um, what they may not have counted on was the fact that the uh, that the special prosecutor would subpoena all the records and he would know right away yeah. who was talking to whom. Yeah. 
He, he knew, I suspect, before he questioned the first person mm -hmm. that Karl Rove had spoken to <clears throat> these reporters, that mm -hmm. Scooter Libby had spoken to these reporters and others. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, you know, uh, I'll bet you, this may come out in the end, who knows, that uh, the special prosecutor was not surprised once by the testimony he received from reporters once he finally got it. Uh-huh. Um, well, I guess he, he um, worked from a circle of, um, of people that were cooperative and, uh, um, and then went to those that uh, went to the reporters after he had uh, yeah. he'd gotten information A circle from of a people of who were cooperative and that would have not known the uh -huh. information. Right. Had access yeah. to the knowledge. One of the things that came out, I think, this week was uh, Ari Fleischer's testimony. And uh, Fleischer said that Libby had come to him and provided him with information on, in a lunch. He had him to lunch. Right. And he said it was un, that was not something he normally did. So he was going out of his way to, um, to do that. Um, but in looking at um, the... Um, uh, Kind of the state of the of news organizations today and of the relationship as well. Uh, we were uh, both at a conference that uh, that um, that looked at anonymous sources that the American Society of Newspaper Editors had, and um, and you wrote a short piece uh, that pulled together uh, the state of uh, news organizations today and the media today. And I wondered if you would read that, and then let's. Then let's uh, talk about parts of it. All right, I will. But let's explain uh, to the class that that everybody in this conference, and there must have been forty or forty-five people, right. I think, yeah. <clears throat> they broke up into small groups, and everybody was asked. Um, this was the um, second day, I think, of the conference. To stop what they were doing, stop the discussions, and just think. For I've forgotten how long we were given, ten or twenty minutes yeah, or something. Yeah, it was not very long. To to write down uh, a description of their view of the state of the news business, news organizations, and um, and I remember the the facilitator saying, "Think of it as that exercise that you sometimes hear on NPR. This I believe. Mm -hmm. In other words." This is something I believe about this business, mm -hmm. the use of anonymous sources and where it stands, and uh, the pluses or minuses. So we all did that. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume you did too. I did. Yeah. And so. I liked yours better. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. I never got to read yours. Non disclosure. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'll read it very brief uh, because it's what you could write in, you know, 10 minutes or less yeah. and just, just write it out by, uh, by pen. Um, uh, so I, I, I wrote this I believe there is a perfect storm battering journalism these days. A whole series of low pressure systems and cold fronts are combining to shake public confidence in news organizations and undermine their foundations. Economic pressures, corporate ownership, competition for ever more fragmented audience, tectonic shifts in the advertising market, the internet, and a digital revolution that is just beginning. All these and more are coming together to challenge the fundamentals of the news business. Most important amidst the rise of opinion journalism and the decline of objective reporting, the public is losing faith in news organizations. People today presume a bias among journalists rather than accept them as fair-minded professionals. They seek out news, the public does, that conforms to their own preconceived views of the world, its problems, and possible solutions. It's not hard to understand why a majority of viewers of Fox News, for example, believe that Saddam Hussein was behind 9-11 or actually had weapons of mass destruction. It's not hard because they were led to believe that by innuendo and implication from the top figures in the Bush administration reported again and again as fact by Fox. Add to this the hostile climate 
in the courts to press freedoms and the pension for secrecy in the post 9-11 world and you have a crisis of confidence among journalists and among the public towards journalists the solution is transparency. In the seven years and now more of regular reporting and analysis of media issues that I have done for the News Hour with Jim Lehrer, I've become convinced that the more people understand about the media, about how and why news organizations make the decisions they do, the greater the public's confidence in the product. If journalists level with the public, can see their mistakes, acknowledge their misjudgments, people will take them and their reporting and their legal predicaments more seriously. That is why I think the New York Times needs to bring its journalistic skills to bear and share with the public the full story of the Judy Miller episode. Not to rehabilitate Judy, but to restore its own credibility with its readers. In the same fashion, CBS News needs to examine its own performance, <clears throat> and PBS needs to analyze its approach to public affairs programming, its issues of balance and fairness, and its role and relevance in a 200-channel universe. In each case, candor with the public is the cure. So that's what I wrote. Now, do you think that um, the public um, has been interested in transparency in government and gradually more interested in transparency in news organizations? Do you think that people who manage news organizations believe that they need to be transparent? Mm -hmm. I mean, not just because the public is at their door asking for it, but do they, do they believe that is part of what their mission is? They should believe it, <clears throat> but I'd say for a long time uh, they have not believed it, that there is a certain arrogance, a certain hubris, a certain we know better. Uh, we are the gatekeepers. We will decide what's news, and we'll tell it to you. And we may or may not share everything we know about how we gather that information. Mm -hmm. And I think that attitude is disastrous for news organizations. <clears throat> their relationship with their reader or viewer or public is the most important thing they have. And they have to be candid with their readers or viewers, otherwise they won't be trusted. I think that's why it was important when it was disclosed that Bob Woodward had learned, as you said, about the uh, identity and name of Valerie mm -hmm. Plame and never shared it, not even with his, his editors. Mm -hmm for close to two years. Mm -hmm. Well, why should the public then believe it's getting the full story if indeed it learns it's not getting the full story right. or the full benefit of his, of his reporting? Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Judy Miller, she never ended up writing anything mm -hmm. about the Valerie Plam case. Um, so I think it's important that news organizations level with the public, share what they know, how they learned it, to the degree that they can without disclosing uh, confidential sources mm -hmm. what institution? and ruining relationships that we hope uh, yeah. and they hope lead to uh, further disclosures and, and more information. What institutional changes need to be made in order for that to come about? Well, I think they are being made. More and more news organizations are uh, uh, employing ombudsmen mm -hmm. to look hard at their own performance, to yeah. answer readers, viewers, complaints, and um, analyze their own uh, uh, process. And I think it's a healthy development. I think it's going on. Mm -hmm. But I, but uh, it is largely in response to public pressure. Mm -hmm. Don't think this is a, some high-minded altruism. Right. I mean, it's largely... Uh, uh, News organizations, which have their own economic problems that I was talking about, mm -hmm. uh, being concerned about um, that bond of faith mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. the, uh, with the public. 
One of the things that seemed to come out in, um, in the conference and in has come out in, in a lot of these cases, including the Valerie Plain one, is what seems to be an ineffective relationship between reporters and editors, that, um, that there seems to be a gap in what information, well, for example, in Bob Woodward's case, um, but there are other cases as well. In, in, in uh, Judy Miller's case, she certainly wasn't giving all of her information. Uh, if, if you go back on her story in Weapons of Mass Destruction, um, where she uh, wrote that, uh, that Saddam, did, they did have them, uh, which turned out not to be accurate. Um, and their edit, her editors really weren't forcing her to um, provide information of where she was getting, what, where she was getting uh, her, her nuggets. Um, do you think there is a way of dealing with that relationship? How do you deal with it? Well, this is a really difficult area because these are human institutions and these are human beings. Do you give greater latitude to a reporter like Bob Woodward with a track record such mm -hmm. as the one that he has? Do you take it on faith uh, when he comes in and reports a story and says, I have three sources on this. I'm not going to tell you who they are, but I do. Mm -hmm. And they're responsible, authoritative sources. <clears throat> and put it in the newspaper and run it. And the answer, generally speaking, is yes. But his editors made him say who his sources were. I mean, he had to tell somebody. Like on, on Watergate, he did have to say that Mark Felt was a, was a source. So he was responsible to, uh, to somebody there. Right. But I, well, the point, yes, that's true. But the point I'm trying to make yeah. is that uh, do certain very experienced, very established, very well-known, very high-profile uh, reporters and writers <clears throat> Uh, get a certain latitude from their editors, yes. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the wake of the Jason Blair incident at the New York Times and, and these various other scandals, uh, newsrooms all across the country now are writing new codes of ethics mm -hmm. in which they spell out and require um, reporters to disclose to, uh, confidentially to an editor the identity uh, and details of their sources. Mm -hmm. uh, they may and should still remain confidential, uh, but uh, this is no longer taken on faith. Now, uh, so that a, a, particularly a younger reporter coming in with a sensational story based on two or three uh, sources is going to have to tell the editor who those sources are. And in some instances, the editor will uh, reserve the right to go and question the source himself or herself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really extreme situation mm -hmm. uh, and not one that you would want to have very often. Mm -hmm. But it does happen. Do you think <clears throat> that the threat of litigation that, ha that hangs over uh, reporters and news organizations uh, generally is, um, is, uh, provides an impetus for that, where an editor was going to say, look, we've got to check this out. You know, we don't want to be left on the hook here. We want to make sure before we report that we have everything together. Do you think that they have a strategy that they know that they're going to have litigation? Well, there is a, they are going to. cases. They, yeah. they know they're going to be subject to, uh, or, or may be subject to uh, legal pressure mm -hmm. to disclose sources, to defend stories. Uh, et cetera. And so, yes, in part it's a reaction to that. <clears throat> but I believe it's also in part an effort to create checks and balances in a newsroom mm -hmm. so that the integrity of the information is, is, is assured. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the, the uh, stories that was that uh, it was an important story that uh, has come out this past year um, and came out from news organizations from the Washington Post was the Jack Abram Abramoff case and uh, his dealings as a lobbyist and his relationships in government. The Washington Post did just a terrific series of pieces on that. And that's the kind of piece that takes a lot of resources. How many news organizations in today's climate are really able to, um, to provide reporters with that kind of time and the resources mm -hmm. to do that sort of story, where they obviously took 
they took, um, I think we, in fact, you could track it back. It took almost a year, I think, for them to do that. Um, and it, it seems like organizations are just, you know, scrambling for funds. Right. And they're just cutting so many people, whether it's a news magazine or, or even, uh, even the New York Times. Um, so do you think that there's a, there's a real difference today than, say, 25 years ago in the number of news organizations that can do these kinds of stories? Oh, yes. Fewer and fewer are equipped and prepared to do it. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, reduction in those ranks <clears throat> is particularly conspicuous in television. Very few uh, even of the major network news divisions have the capacity or are structured to conduct long-term investigative mm -hmm. uh, reporting projects and then uh, put them on the air. This is a result of the, of the budget and staff cuts that you're talking about, of the economic uh, pressures on these uh, network news divisions to make a profit. Mm -hmm. They're now small cogs in very large wheels owned by large conglomerates. And, uh, you know, if you're uh, the CBS News Division, one I know particularly well, um, that used to be an enormous source of pride and prestige for CBS owned then by its mm -hmm. founder, William Paley. Right, right. Uh, today, the CBS News division, with an annual budget of around $350 million, is a small mm -hmm. cog in a conglomerate called Viacom. Mm -hmm. And Viacom has many, many holdings. And uh, the news division is expected today um, and required today uh, to produce a profit. It's a, it's a cost center mm -hmm. like any other, like uh, a reality show that has to have a certain rating mm -hmm. to uh, stay on the air and bring in the uh, cash, bring in the advertising. The news division, um, I mean, uh, Don Hewitt once said that it, uh, the founder of uh, 60 Minutes, he, he once conceded that perhaps he was, um, he was to blame more than anyone else because he proved that news could be profitable, profitable yeah. very profitable. Um, when he was saying this about 10 years ago, uh, 60 Minutes uh, was bringing in $75 million a year in net profit. It's more today. Mm -hmm. um, and so they are required to make their numbers, as the mm -hmm. phrase goes in business. And uh, I think there's a good deal more pressure to make your number than there is to uh, turn up the Jack Abramoff uh, uh -huh. uh, case. Now, that's in the, in the television. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in... Um, and it applies as well to cable systems. They are not set up to do in-depth, long-term, hard-nosed investigative reporting. They're just not structured to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Therefore, most of it is done by newspapers. Mm -hmm. As a practical matter, they are the only ones with the staff and the numbers of people and the willingness to take up to a year Mm -hmm. on a story, no matter how big, and it's a very big story, and it's going to have major ramifications mm -hmm. in this government, this administration, and the upcoming elections, mm -hmm. <clears throat> congressional elections in, in November. So it's a big story, but only newspapers today and perhaps the wire service agencies are set up mm -hmm. to conduct that sort of an investigation and, and support it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go to some questions. Please. Um, Towson, do you have some questions? Why don't you come, why don't you come up front? You can ask too. <laughs> Just 
one of my <clears throat> students from Towson who's working at the Athens Middle East Institute. Yeah. Can we hear? Uh... Yeah. Okay, somebody from Towson? All right. Um, does the press have a limit uh, in what they can actually divulge um, on national security? And if so, what is that limit that you think, including, say, uh, domestic spying, the administration's position is that they're not really spying on, you know, at the average American, the average Joe, they're taking care of people that have foreign contacts, Al-Qaeda, so on and so forth. Is that a legitimate excuse? Okay, that's, a, that's sort of two parts, right? Mm -hmm. The first part of your question was, are there limits, or does uh, do news organizations have limits on what <clears throat> they can uh, report? And um, I, I, I'm not an attorney here, but um, you know, the First Amendment says Congress shall pass no law to abridge mm -hmm. the freedom of the press uh, to disclose factual, responsible information if it if it gathers it and finds it. So there is not a legal limit, but that doesn't mean that a responsible news organization should or will uh, report information that they know will endanger lives or, um, well, let's just leave it at that, that will endanger lives. Mm -hmm. And therefore they exercise um, what I would argue is a responsible level of self-censorship and mm -hmm. restraint. Um, and sometimes they do that in response to a plea from the government, and sometimes they decide themselves. Um, a correspondent in Vietnam, for example, <clears throat> signed a waiver uh, signed a statement saying that he or she would not disclose in advance military movements or, op or operations for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. And nobody, and that was, that was respected across the board. Uh, the second uh, part of your question was, if I recall, the argument that, th that this is, uh, that the program is in fact justified and selective mm -hmm. and um, uh, designed to pick up or trip uh, communications mm -hmm. uh, not among ordinary Americans but, uh, but rather uh, among those in some sort of communication with um, uh, known or suspected terrorist groups. I know that's the rationale. I, I understand that. I think the question that remains to be seen is how, um, how focused is the program, which incidentally is still going on. Um, how much uh, useful information has been uh, obtained from it, and is it justified under existing law, statutes? The, Administration, the Bush uh, White House, argues that it is justified by the original congressional resolution authorizing the use of force against Saddam Hussein. And in the wake of 9-11. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the wake of 9-11. Well, you're going to have an argument about that in public, in the Congress, and, um, and in the courts, I mm -hmm. suspect. Yeah. Uh, ACLU and others have filed suits. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is going to be argued. I can't answer it um, definitively at this time, but I understand that that's the mm -hmm. the uh, administration's defense. And it certainly is a would be an issue that would be discussed in all the newsrooms where uh, where they're going to uh, use information about the program. Um, do you have a question? I would like to return to you. You, you mentioned the issue no. of journalistic integrity and journalistic freedom. At the same time, the issue of how do you disclose or not disclose who you have talked to when this is such an intricate relationship between the well-established journalists, because they have to get there through personal contacts with government officials. And so where do you draw the line between 
you know, telling I know who leaked the information versus protecting your sources because they are the ones who give you future work. I mean, well, it's a really difficult issue. A, a, a crucial part of the, drawing that line is uh, what commitments have you made to confidentiality? In some cases, there is no commitment. You obtain the information, learn it one way or another, sometimes from documents, sometimes from individuals who don't require confidentiality. That's some of the, some of the time. But if they do, uh, you should, the journalist should really weigh in this day and age whether he or she can provide confidentiality, can make a promise of confidentiality that will stand up against a legal challenge. Uh, because, as we see uh, today, it's a pretty serious matter and uh, could end up threatening uh, the journalist with jail time. So you'd better think very carefully. <clears throat> so what newsrooms are, and, and editors and others are adopting is they'd like to minimize the use of those confidential sources. They would like to see in um, every case possible uh, how narrow they can uh, focus the confidentiality so that it's about this and not about this. And uh, the circumstances under which uh, uh, that confidential promise is given and, and will be held. I mean, you know, I'd say if you were an investigative reporter today and talking with a <clears throat> government source uh -huh. on a sensitive matter, you'd better think twice about making that promise of confidentiality. Some newspapers and news organizations are now requiring the reporter in the field to check back with the editor mm -hmm. and say, may I make that promise of confidentiality? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as, as many uh, pressures as there are to, um, uh, to not rely on anonymous sources, uh, one of the things you notice, and also from the government side of trying to stop people from talking, that NSA story came out. And uh, that came out, I think, in a traditional kind of way in that there was somebody who felt that the pro program had, uh, was illegal and uh, that they were um, concerned about it and um, provided the information to a reporter. So it seems to, <laughs> the, the lure on both sides is there, both to provide the information to leak it in spite of the fact that, uh, that if it's a person within the administration, which I assume it is, that, um, uh, that the cost can be really high for right. providing information. Uh, I also assume that that was the motivation of the person mm -hmm. or persons who yeah. leaked the uh, information about the program. And remember that this is a case where at the highest level mm -hmm. the government urged the news organization, in this case the New York Times, not to disclose it. Mm -hmm. And the president, face to face with the publisher and editor, made his case that this was an important program, important to the national security of the United States, and that disclosure would, would uh, damage it. He made it, the New York Times, for having held the story for a long time, came to a decision that it should go ahead and publish it anyway, mm -hmm. despite a personal appeal from the president. Mm -hmm. And the circle of people who knew about it was very small. You know, it's come out that Tom Ridge said, who was who was the uh, was the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, was unaware of the program. Um, so, so it shows know. you that it was very closely held. Now, let me ask you this: as somebody who's uh, around the White House certainly a lot more than I am, has the administration? conceded that the president met with uh, the publisher and the editor of the New York Times and asked them not to publish it? Yes, I think that... Um, Has that they, been confirmed? Yeah, I think that's been mm -hmm. confirmed. Um, I don't think that uh, Scott talked about it in the briefing, but um, uh, but I think it's it's come out that they've, mm -hmm. they've talked about it. Well, it's definitely because come out. I, part I of, just didn't know whether I think it's confirmed. part of their discussion of how much they cared about this and how yeah, yeah, important I understand they thought that. it was. That to that end, they asked it. They asked them uh, not to publish. I it. understand that. 
Right. Um, let me ask you a, another question. Do you think that there was any golden age of uh, information in terms of the relationship between um, uh, between government and the press? That there's a time we should be going back to, or is there something we should look forward to in terms of what we what we need to establish for the citizen? I'd say, you know, and this will sound strange, uh, that we ought to stay right where we are. That the uh, the disclosures that I would argue that the that news organizations are more honest today about what they can learn and, and level with their viewers and readers than they were back in a cozier era prior to Vietnam and Watergate when um, journalists saw it as an obligation to protect um, presidents and, and lesser officials uh, from their own private peccadilloes and weaknesses and or, or just situations. I mean the famous case often cited is reporters agreeing during the uh, third and fourth term of, of uh, FDR not to photograph him in a, a wheelchair uh, showing the effects of his uh, polio. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, the, and the limitation on, on his physical movement. Uh, the, the nation was at war, mm -hmm. and um, I, I guess journalists felt that it was inappropriate, maybe disloyal, mm -hmm. uh, to show that uh, the President of the United States, the Commander-in-Chief, had a serious physical impairment. Uh -huh. Now, it didn't impair his brain uh, or you know, is necessarily his ability to be president of the United States, but it does, did impair him, his movement. And they cooperated in covering that up, not photographing him ever in a wheelchair, uh, and not disclosing and not writing about it. Well, that would never happen today. But it, that if, would never happen today. If you, I, I think in, in that relationship, they knew that the public knew he had uh, polio. They, they felt that the public had the information, and so they, they didn't provide those pictures. But when when Wilson was, um, uh, had suffered a stroke and he was in a wheelchair, photographers worked very hard in order to try you know, to get pictures of him. In fact, there were sheep that were on the uh, South Lawn area that would, um, the sheep would go, they would, uh, during the day they were out and then they would be brought closer to the White House and uh, a photographer was caught trying to dress up as a sheep so he could get in <laughs> and take a picture of Wilson in his wheelchair yeah. because they wanted to show the degree to which he was debilitated. And I think in, in Roosevelt's case, you know, they bought into the, the fact, well, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's fine in terms of his mind. But if, if you look at his press conferences and you look at the last year, he really was ill. And, um, and very ill. He took a month and went to South Carolina in 1944, and um, uh, had only a couple of um, he had a couple of reporters in Doug Cornell and and uh, a couple of others that he talked to. But people didn't talk about how ill he was. And so in that case, it wasn't just the polio; it was the fact that the guy just had terrible respiratory. Uh, illness and uh, and he you could just tell from reading his press conferences he had gone downhill mm -hmm. um, a great deal today you're right that uh, that just wouldn't happen I agree with you too that I think it, the relationship is a lot better oh. uh, because we get more information out of it when you have the two sides being cozy and friendly that's when you're really in trouble yeah. I mean there are questions about uh, what was known and what was disclosed I don't know about uh, President Kennedy's physical impairments, right. terrible back problems and, yeah. and other things, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, to say nothing of his romantic interests. Yeah. Uh, so th those things were protected. Yeah. Today the attitude is publish and be damned, and, and uh, publish uh, first and argue about it later. Yeah. But what we're seeing is there's a lot of argument about it later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the and the news organizations are under a lot of pressure in the courts mm -hmm. uh, when they do mm -hmm. publish uh, sensitive material. Right. 
Another question? Towson? I didn't quite hear the end. I would threaten national security on some level. By Al Qaeda, uh, uh, letting Al Qaeda know uh, what uh, sources. Um, I, I don't have an independent judgment of that. It's mm -hmm. uh, hard uh, for me to say. But um, it's certainly, if I were um, uh, an Al Qaeda operative, phoning my friend in Cleveland, uh, I would uh, hesitate to do so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> After learning of the extent uh, of this uh, program, uh, as to the administration's assertion, repeated by Vice President Cheney on the broadcast last night, that this program alone has saved thousands of American lives. Mm -hmm. uh, when asked for evidence of that, he says, I can't discuss it. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to say. Um, the whole implicit message of Vice President Cheney is, we know a lot more than you do. And you're just going to have to trust us on this one. It saved thousands of lives. And uh, we say so, so... You have to believe us. Well, increasingly today, the public and news organizations are not prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. It's just not enough. And they have found sources in, in the government who are familiar with the program, who have been working in the program, and said that they've netted very few people um, by, the, by the program. And so it's going to increasingly put pressure on the administration. And I think particularly in an election year, that, um, that members of Congress are uncomfortable. There are a lot of members of Congress who are uncomfortable. You could see in, in uh, the Judiciary Committee the other day when Attorney General Gonzalez was questioned, there were Republicans who were worried about the program. Mm -hmm. And that goes in the House side, too. And the more that circle broadens, uh, the more they are going to have to divulge information. Well, you have a conflict of interest here between the legitimate and obvious national security interests of the United States and the legitimate and statutory um, rights and privileges and freedoms of its citizens. Mm -hmm. These two things are in conflict. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to know where the line should be drawn without having all the information. Exactly. Yeah. So how can we answer your question? Yeah. Did it or did it not hurt? Or does it or does it not? You know, yeah. it's still going on. Uh, hurt or damage the national security of the United States, um, the, the fact that this program has been disclosed, at least mm -hmm. partially disclosed. Mm -hmm. I, I can't answer that question. Another? Oh, okay. I guess then go ahead and ask a follow-up question. It seems from the perspective of what we know today that the president had the possibility and ability actually to get this done with a court sanction. There is a 24-7 secret court that is available to, to uh, mm -hmm. issue the rights to, to listen in on these conversations, and yet he chose not to do so, which to me leads me to believe that this is not just an issue of trust of individual citizens and the press, and, and the constitutional rights, but also an executive privilege of the president to be able to do pretty much whatever he wants um, under conditions of war or, or national threat. What is your view on, on that aspect? Well, that's what he asserts, and uh, that he has um, the uh, right and legal justification uh, to do this, and that's what is going to have to be sorted out in the courts. Um, and analyze, and pr I wouldn't be surprised, taken to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to see if people agree, uh, if the courts agree, that, that he does have this. What you do know <clears throat> is that there's no check and balance uh, in, in operation here. If the <laughs> executive branch decides it can do it and goes ahead and does it and provides its own rationale, 
then you don't have the classic check and balance that you're supposed to have in a in a three uh, mm -hmm. a three part government. So um, uh, you know it's it's quite an assumption to make. Uh, has the information been seriously useful? Has as as uh, Vice President Cheney uh, suggests it. Um, help stop or avoid further terrorist attack in the United States or against U.S. interests abroad? How, am I, how is one to answer that? Right. Uh, Talson? Um, I have a question. Um, I think that the Department of Defense has been very good about Well, it, 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 the principle ought to be the greatest possible transparency that you can have with uh, your reader and your viewer uh, within the law um, and acknowledging what you know, how you learned it, uh, how, how it came about. I, I, I think some of those stories about the stories are mm -hmm. themselves very important. And they will restore the confidence uh, and faith of people if they are able to read um, how the story was obtained. Where it becomes difficult is in a case like the NSA uh, mm -hmm. surveillance story. The New York Times feels constrained in what it can acknowledge and what it can say publicly about how it got the story. And that's where, that's where it gets sticky. Do you think um, that ombudsmen or ombudspersons have made a difference within news organizations? And can you think of any specific cases where their presence has um, has made a difference to the functioning of reporter to reporters or of management? I think they uh, they make a difference um, on a week to week basis mm -hmm. um, because. They are an outlet for the frustrations of viewers and readers They, uh, who deserve answers to their questions, who object to some of the things they see in print or on television <coughs> or on radio. And they have, in effect, a reader's representative or a viewer's representative who can go to management and ask those questions, may not get all the answers all the time, but it's a, all in all a, a, a pretty healthy development. Mm -hmm. And there was one uh, recently that was a little different. It was in the uh, New York Times where the ombudsman explained what the news hole was, exactly how, much, how many column inches are there in the, di in the different sections, and how, how do they have to shift things around when a big story comes, because even with September 11th, they couldn't expand the paper what they'd have to do is take from some sections. And I think that's an interesting kind of uh, piece for readers just to know how the, uh, the paper is put together. I agree with you. And I mm -hmm. thought it was interesting. And, and all he was disclosing there yeah. in the form of an interview with a key editor was yeah. the nuts and bolts of how it works. works. Mm -hmm. But as I said earlier, I believe that the more the public knows about how it works, the more tolerant they are and willing to believe they are that this is that these are professional human beings trying to make the best possible decisions. Mm -hmm.